All right. And with that, I would like to welcome our guest, Loa Watros, Principal Consultant of Grid SME, along with John Fanzio, uh, CEO, CEO of Grid SME, and Tim McDuffie, Senior Business Development Engineer at Smarter Grid Solutions. And we're going to start off with <laughs> Grid SME. All right. Thanks, Thomas. Appreciate it. Um, actually, Lowell's going to kick this off, so I'll share my screen and let Lowell do a quick introduction, and then uh, I'll jump in here shortly. Hey, Th Thomas, you got to stop sharing your screen before I can go share mine. All right, Good evening. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Lowell Watcher, so I'm a principal consultant with Grid SME. I wanted to spend a minute or two going, uh, giving you a brief overview of my background and hopefully that will give you a sense of why I am so DER, distributed energy resource positive. I have uh, education, I have an engineering science degree and have worked in the power industry for, since college in a variety of positions for over 35 years. I started out with Edison and I was involved in plant engineering work at diverse locations, including conventional gas fire generation, cogen facility at a paper mill, energy services plant providing compressed air and chilled water to a wide body aircraft assembly facility. These uh, generation facilities range from 10 megawatts to 1000 megawatts. I also worked at Edison's uh, system operations division responsible for such areas as daily pre-scheduling of all Edison generation and power contracts to testifying to CPUC proceedings on uh, forecasted fuel and purchase power budgets. So I did that for a number of years. Then I moved on to the Muni world. I worked for the city of Reading for two decades and I was doing mostly power supply resourcing, load forecasting and so forth. But I spent my last few years there in uh, their energy services and customer service divisions. And there I had direct interface with customers involved everything from energy efficiency rebate programs customer solar, thermal energy storage, electric vehicle market development, and including charging station uh, procurement and so forth. So those last few items I just mentioned were um, very definitely distributed energy resources. And so if we could go on to the next slide. As you can see, uh, unless you've been under a rock, we've, we've got some changes going on in the electric grid. And we're in a definite period of transformation. Um, every aspect of the grid from how we generate, sell, distribute, and pay for energy is being flipped on its head. So the, the primary di driving force behind all these things is the advent of distributed energy resources. So as you can see, you're going from on the left, a traditional grid structure, and we're going over to the right, which is more complex, more involved, but it, uh, it has a lot of opportunities that we didn't have in the old world. So I'm gonna to touch on the um, items on the next three slides that are kind of the basis of this uh, switchover. So as you can see, I've listed uh, on there the uh, various categories of DERs and I use the terms that are FERC defined and I'll get a bit into that a little bit later. But as you can see, we have uh, energy storage, which is on nearly everybody's mind. And the items there that have been different is that uh, until recently, we didn't need large quantities of storage. Well, now we do. And concurrently or semi-concurrently, new battery chemistries and a dramatic lowering of cost. So really we're kind of at an accelerating crossroads on energy storage and intermittent generation. Other items like distributed generation, uh, backup gen sets and cogen, they've been around a long time, but they still have a role in the future. And we'll see that uh, as we go through a little bit more of the information. Demand response, which is AC load control, uh, hot water heaters and so forth. Again, a more traditional, it's been around for a couple of decades or more, but will integrate, I think, well with these other technologies. Energy efficiency, uh, smart thermostats, lighting control upgrades, all those items are a little bit more esoteric, but they still will have a role. And when we get into the control systems for aggregating, that, uh, that'll be evident. 
Then there's thermal energy storage, which is chilled water, ice, or molten salt. Those are um, out there in a distributed or less distributed technology. has been around again for, for decades and will be integratable into the future. And then lastly, electric vehicles and uh, electric charging equipment, uh, grid tied. Those items are uh, in the news nearly every day and they're uh, expanding, the technology is changing. It's uh, an area we could put a whole webinar on the pros and maybe a few cons of electric vehicle rollouts just in and of themselves. So to get all this going, at least from a regulatory and compliance standpoint, I've highlighted here on this slide, the uh, federal and California major legislation. So what we have here is we have FERC Order 841, which opened up the wholesale market for energy storage to be participating in them, that area, which is been deregulated for a long time since the, the early 90s to in accelerating degrees, but energy storage is a different kind. It's not, it's not generation and it's not transmission. So it took for order 841 to get some footing going for electric storage in wholesale markets. And that one that was followed up with FERC order 2222, which some of you may be quite familiar with, which removes barriers for participation and ag DER aggregation. And that's a key item to be bringing together all these diverse resources spread over many, many areas. The technology is there today to go forward to uh, implement some of those things in the RTO and ISO markets. So those are two uh, national items, but they apply uh, uniformly to California. More California centric, we have um, SB Senate Bill 350 and Senate Bill 100, which mandated uh, collectively, they mandated uh, integrated resource plans for all load serving entities in California. So that's investor owned utilities, munis and community choice aggregators all have to file those either with the CEC for munis or the CPUC for IOUs and for CCAs. So those uh, are the, the thing that we'll have a lot more information coming out in various venues for people who want to delve through those rather large documents, but there's a lot of information. I think you'll see DERs accelerating in the next cycles within uh, this next decade. And then I just mentioned also recent uh, SB 1339 and the CPUC decision that uh, impacts microgrid tariffs. So that just happened a few days ago, the CPUC decision. And basically that adopts microgrid rates, tariffs, and rules for large investor owned utilities to facilitate the commercialization of microgrids. Um, a complex undertaking for sure. And maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that in a moment. And then lastly, rule 21, um, as stated on the slide, it's CPUC guiding document for behind the meter uh, DER installations on the connection to the local distribution facilities. And uh, the first version of that was created 20 years ago. So there's a lot of DER history that's embedded in the old and current system that uh, because of technology change and some added DERs, we're gonna see uh, more and more DER implementations. And I think that the, the current legislation and probably some modifications within this decade will just only en enhance that. Next slide. So looking ahead to the future, um, I think the points that I have on this particular slide kind of just uh, highlight some of the stuff that we uh, collectively have been seeing in the, the news uh, as you follow the energy markets. Um, we have high utilization wind and storage, solar and storage, and then standalone storage, including behind the meter, which would be your Tesla wall, power walls and, and there are other venues, uh, vendors for uh, the uh, distributed on the behind the meter. And then there's many in the uh, higher grid uh, level connections. So it's uh, one of the things that I've seen in integrated resource planning and so forth is DERs and DERMs, which is DERs uh, uh, management systems 
are going to be used more and more to meet one of the major things if you look at the end game is CARB's GHG mandates of reducing carbon emissions. And with that, uh, with that it's not gonna go away. That's not gonna change. It may just become more evident as to what we're looking at going forward uh, into this decade and beyond. So I, I see some things that are really maturing in this decade. And then I see those just continuing on in the 2031 to 2045 time period. So um, I want to leave a one note on here, just an example to drive this point home is building electrification. Some of you may be familiar with that. And that's basically replacing natural gas uh, uh, devices for heating and cooking and so forth with electric only devices. Well, some planning uh, aspects of one major utility, they're counting on that to meet the last increments of GHG get, uh, reductions. So you're looking at DERs being integrated both directly and indirectly into the planning for the future meeting of the, the grid needs. So um, I'm gonna finish up my area of the discussion and for today is, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that I started a power plant and it was back in the 1980s, uh, which was running nearly nonstop uh, because the San Onofre nuclear plant wasn't on service yet. And so uh, now today, if you went to that site, you'd never know that the plant I started at existed. There's nothing there but a field. And San Onofre is permanently shut down and closed. So there's a lot of changes uh, on the grid that uh, is not gonna change. I think it's gonna accelerate. And I think DERs are definitely gonna be part of that uh, accelerating change. So that wraps me up. Thanks, Lil. And uh, yeah, so this is John Franzino. I'm CEO of Great SME. My, my background's a little different than Lil's. I've, I've only got about a decade in the industry so far. And I jumped right into the, the crazy solar coaster as that part of the industry calls it. I worked at a, a solar EPC doing engineering design work and um, energy estimations and all that good stuff then joined Grid SME about six and a half years ago as an engineering intern and started doing a lot of uh, NERC regulatory compliance work, which is where I found my way um, into the cybersecurity space. So last four years, I've been primarily focused building out our uh, cybersecurity division and focused on network operations and cybersecurity services uh, for the renewable energy industry. Um, and some of the unique challenges that are coming to uh, rise to the surface with this distributed energy resource environment. So this is Grant Smith's first kind of clean start um, uh, participation. So we weren't sure how, how deep, how technical to go. So we kept it high level, but if anyone wants to dive into the details, please don't hesitate to uh, pepper us with some questions after the fact. So yeah, we're all, we're all aware, it seems like, you know, we're, we're moving from a vertically integrated model to a distributed model, right? Um, and so while we're solving one problem, aka or, or you know, working on our greenhouse uh, or, or, or gas, greenhouse gas emission problem and our environmental problem, we're creating 10 new problems downstream with this distributed energy resource architecture. Just like our humans, us humans are always good at. We solve one problem, we create five new <laughs> unintended problems that we didn't foresee. So we're gonna talk about today just the challenges and some of these problems at the, you know, at a high, high level, um, not even go into targeted solutions, but really just on, you know, in the entrepreneurial spirit, focus on what are these challenges ahead for all that are involved um, in the utility, electric utility world from the traditional IOUs to the munis to the end use customer. Um, and then hopefully, you know, start ferreting in on how do we provide solutions to those challenges co collectively. So everyone's probably familiar with the duck curve, um, right? So this came out from Cal ISO, I don't know, around probably 2014 or 2013. Um, and, you know, we have an advent of intermittent resource generation, wind and solar coming onto the grid that are must take resources. Um, the independent system operator has to take that energy that's being delivered to the grid and in order to balance generation load like they have to do every second every day, they're moving other, other generation around, right? Um, and so, um, this has created, you know, a complex grid operations problem as more and more solar comes on the grid at high volumes every single year, especially these last three years and looking ahead at the forecast. Um, so now the balancing act that these grid operators have to do has, is more difficult than it's ever been. Um, and we have more challenges ahead of us. But 
one of the things I want to make sure we all point out is that the same um, characteristics of intermittent generation, you know, inverter-based resources that are causing some of this pain uh, for the operators, aka their, their fast ramp rate, you know, in conjunction with the fact that we can't control the radiance or uh, wind speed. Um, can that same fast ramp rate and granular control capability uh, can be used to solve the problem as well. Um, it's just that we need to uh, change our operating methodologies and construct um, so that the utilities and, and system operators can actually leverage the solar uh, and wind facilities as an asset to reliability rather than degradation to reliability, which is how they've kind of been looked at to date. So, you know, one of the, one of the you know first and major studies on this was by was between California ISO, the National Renewable Energy Laboratories, and um, First Solar. So, you know, they took I think this was with the Topaz power plant, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so, what they did is ran it through. Uh, you know, a bunch of tests where basically they put this facility on AGC, automatic generator control, just like they would a hydro facility or a combined cycle facility and said, okay, well, if we allow this facility to operate within specific parameters and aren't just operating to the PPA um, and saying, hey, deliver maximum energy at, you know, power factor of one, what could we do? Um, and lo and behold, if the system operator um, is telling the plant to do do things, um, the plant can respond very quickly and meet those operating requirements. Um, there's just not the market mechanisms and operating constructs in place to, tip, to allow for this in, in the traditional construct, right? This is part of some of those tariffs and changes that Lowell's alluding to, not those directly, but we need some of those to operate or to open up the wholesale market and allow renewable facilities um, such as this, you know, Topaz Solar to participate in ancillary uh, service products, um, you know, and, and you know they can to some extent. Some of those uh, uh, regulations have opened up what storage can participate in terms of the wholesale market, um, but there's definitely some regular uh, tariff changes that need to occur so that it makes economic sense for a solar facility to operate at let's say 50, 70 percent of its capacity, so it could provide regulation up or other ancillary services. Um, so, you know, it should be blatantly obvious right now that the level of coordination and control that needs to happen for all of these dis different distributed systems is, you know, pretty much at a scale and level of complexity that, you know, has, hasn't been seen before, um, really in any system, definitely not the electric grid. You know, the, the obvious example, um, and you know, that we always harp on is the distribution system that, you know, is in everyone's communities that is designed to deliver power to your home. It was designed for, you know, unidirectional flow, get power to the house. And of course, now that we're all putting, you know, uh, solar on our roofs, we have a bi-directional flow on that, on that distribution system. So, I mean, one of the hot acronyms in the industry right now, that I'm sure everyone's heard of is ADMS, Advanced Distribution Management System. Um, you know, and this is an area from, you know, an entrepreneurial standpoint, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that have been spent by utilities and hundreds and hundreds more to be spent um, and to solve this distribution management system to get the visibility and control needed to the distribution level now that we have, you know, bi-directional flows and lots of complicated stuff that needs to occur in order to enable, um, you know, the next wave of DERs. Um, and then of course, DERMS and, and Lowell already mentioned that distributed energy resource management system. That's what's gonna tie all of this together from you know, soup to nuts. Um, but the point being here is that these technologies are in their infancy. You know, we're working and partnering with different DERMS providers and ADMS providers and utilities are putting out RFP saying, we want DERMS um, and they don't even know what they're asking for yet. Um, you know, it's still really in the exploratory phase. We don't know what DERMS means tomorrow we, and we don't know if that's going to be the acronym that you know winds up sticking but we do know some more um, advanced uh, resource management capabilities um, are definitely needed on the grid and so there's a huge area to fill that technology gap coming and then of course we just have the pure scale issue i mean everyone's heard about the proliferation of the uh, internet of things um, but there's a subset of the internet of things the industrial internet of things um, and especially in the renewable energy world um, the way these, uh, you know, 50 to 350 megawatt facilities that cost $500 million 
are being connected by industrial Internet of Things devices, um, you know, is very, very, very different than how the utilities approach this. Um, you know, there, there would be no such, uh, that type of connection and, and connectability to all these different devices would, you know, was never occurring in the utility world. So, you know, we just have a sheer numbers problem on our hand in terms of how many sensors and devices need to get connected um, to the system and be able to be viewed and, and operated by the system operators and, and other uh, entities in order to all make this all work. But if uh, connecting, you know, billions of devices wasn't hard enough and doing so in a coordinated and orchestrated way, we got to do this securely as well. Um, and that's, you know, where some of the biggest challenges, you know, from, from my standpoint come into play when we look at how the DER world is shaking out right now. Um, you know, like I started to mention, the utility, vertically integrated utility of the past, there was no need to connect any of these control systems to the internet. They had dedicated um, secure communication channels. But now that you have, you know, an operator in North Carolina uh, managing and maintaining facilities in California and, you know, all sorts of different scenarios, so many different vendors and parties involved with the overall ownership and operations of a, a DR asset, they have to be connected to the internet. Um, otherwise, none of this would make economic sense in the end, really. Um, so, you know, today it's very common practice for those facilities to um, be accessible from the internet. And unfortunately, it's also because this is all new for everyone still, it's very common for those assets to be sitting on the open internet and not particularly uh, appropriately protected. So, you know, this is a screenshot from a tool called Shodan. You can go to it on, you know, search for Google uh, for Shodan, go to it and think of Shodan like the Google for internet connected devices. Um, if you want to search for interesting or devices, whatever that means to you, um, be a you know, manufacturer, protocols being used, um, et cetera, et cetera, you can go to Shodan and do that search across the internet. Um, and this, you know, Shodan has picked up on the fact that ICS systems are coming on the internet very quickly. And just recently, um, between yesterday when I put this slide together and the last time I checked Shodan, probably a few months ago, they put up a new website that is specific to this ICS radar that's just for industrial control systems just showing how many of these are sitting on the, on the open internet in every country. And the goal of Shodan is to show this information to asset owners, AKA the good guys, um, because the bad guys already know. So a lot of people say, well, what, why would anybody put a tool like out this, make it that much easier? I mean, the unfortunate truth of the matter is that the people, the bad guys that want to look, they already can look and they know. So this is more to be used as an educational tool for those asset owners that maybe didn't realize um, they are port forwarding Modbus over the open internet, and maybe that's not the smartest, most secure thing to do. So I don't want to try to pollute anyone's minds with um, potential solutions to some of these high level challenges we uh, glossed over here, but just you know, remind that every one of these challenges is a good opportunity, whether from you know, a, new, a new startup business or you know, changing your service offering. Um, to better support new challenges. You know, what we were doing at Gridsme, you know, 10 years ago when Gridsme is founded, it isn't at all what we're doing today. You know, the only core theme is that we've been helping our clients, you know, navigate uh, these challenges and changes and helping them um, facilitate the, the grid of the future. But everything's changing so quick these days um, that, you know, one piece of advice is just to, you know, keep your eyes and ears open and be ready to pivot quickly because we don't even know what challenges we're going to have five years from now at any level of detail. So, like I said, happy to dive deeper into any of that because uh, that was definitely a high level overview. But um, thanks for having us and uh, looking here forward to the discussion. All right. All right. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I know the first time that I felt like, okay, maybe, you know, climate change is something that we could beat was when someone said it was um, about connecting all these different things through a network because um, I can tweet from my fridge. So I figure, you know, we're pretty good at connecting things to networks. So maybe we can do this. Um, and with that, I want to welcome Tim McDuffie. Um, he's going to lead us in a discussion about network microgrid options for rural communities, which, you know, we're um, kind of really excited about because we have some rural communities here that 
definitely need microgrids and can benefit from them. So I'm going to let him share his experience. All right. Um, I just want to make sure you guys can actually see the screen, the, the PowerPoint here. You see it. All right. Very good. Um, so yeah, my name is Tim McDuffie. I work for a company called Smarter Grid Solutions to dovetail on what uh, the Grid SME uh, fellows were talking about. Uh, we're actually a Durham's company. Uh, we're located out of Glasgow, Scotland. And um, the, the market, the culture, the regulatory environment, the tariff structures, everything in the UK and in Europe and then also in Canada is uh, much more, I would say, ahead of the times than, than they are here in, uh, in the States. A lot of that's due to the uh, confederated nation or the confederated um, way that our power grid is, you know, put together and operated all these different, I mean, if you think about the United States, there's hundreds, thousands of, you know, IOUs, communities, those sorts of things, um, or those sorts of companies. And when you go to uh, the UK, there's six. <laughs> so it's, it's a lot easier to get six companies on board to do stuff than it is to get a few thousand. So, um, but my background's in electrical engineering. I graduated um, back in 2006, licensed in uh, California, Florida, a few other states. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, our, is a specific project uh, that we're working on for the Hoopa Valley Tribe in Northern California. Uh, so Hoopa Valley is located about an hour east of Eureka um, in, in a very nice uh, section along the Trinity River. And recently they ran into some issues with the public safety power shutoffs, which I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with. So this just kind of gives an overview of you know, the layout of the tribe um, and also highlights the fact that they are surrounded by tier two and tier three fire risks or fire, uh, fire risk zones. So um, just like the rest of us, but probably to a larger extent, uh, you know, they constant, constantly battling with uh, power, power shutoffs and then just the, you know, all of the disruption that comes along with being in a higher fire in a high fire threat area um, and the other thing that makes this situation a bit unique is that um, i don't show it on here but uh, there's one distribution feeder that feeds the tribe from the south and that's it they're at the very end of a very long uh, transmission to sub transmission to distribution feeder line so um, when that goes out or they shut it off to try to manage fire risk in these areas it's it's over and done um, and they've had some pretty significant impacts uh, on their tribe. It's a very high el elderly population, um, you know, and, and they came to us. It was back about a year, a little bit more than a year ago. And we said, hey, well, we're happy to take a look at it and put together some ideas. So this is some actual data from one of their buildings. What's interesting is, is that you pull their usage data for the last year and across what you're looking for here is essentially uh, outages at the same time in the same time scales across multiple buildings. that will tell you that the distribution circuit or the, the entire substation was down because there's a few smaller circuits that go out from the substation. Uh, but this allowed us to sort of quantify what the need is at Hoopa and you know what we could provide from a, a microgrid perspective. Now, what's interesting is um, one of the major challenges uh, of some of these different things, like the community microgrid enablement tariff that was touched on earlier, uh, and some of the other things that are happening is that uh, utilities, and with very, very good reason, are not comfortable with third party commercial folks um, putting power on their grid when there isn't supposed to be power on their grid. So their, their idea of saying, hey, we're just going to shut this off and you guys can go, you know, put, do whatever you want to do on our lines is, is like, there's a lot of reasons why that's a bad idea. Um, and so they are moving towards that. Um, I don't think they're ever, I, I don't know. It's it, right now a lot of the, cause I'm in the, I'm in the microgrid tariff working group. And from what we're seeing, a lot of the, the track two and track three developments are pushing towards uh, commercially built, op, commercially built, commercially funded systems that are then essentially turned over to the utilities. You can argue it both ways, um, but if I were a utility, I'd feel a heck of a lot more comfortable doing that than just trusting a third party to run my grid. 
There's definitely arguments both ways on that. Uh, but the reason I bring that up is, is because as it stands right now, putting a lot, you know, when, when you look at a distribution system, you start with, uh, you know, if we're going to power sections of, a, a, of the end of a feeder or the sections at, at, a, at a remote substation, the best place to start is a substation and to inject power at different feeders or on the primary side of the substation bus and then just let it basically push power out to all the different areas. So what they did at a project called the Blue Lake Rancheria um, wasn't actually on a distribution. It wasn't at the substation level, it was at the distribution feeder level because Blue Lake actually owned a bunch or owned some of their own um, distribution equipment. So they were able to centralize their microgrid and tie in at a higher voltage, which then spread down to more buildings. In the case of Hoopa Valley Tribe, what we found was that uh, they don't own any of their own infrastructure. It's all uh, utility owned all the way down to the meters. So in the absence, and, and they said, you know, we went to them and said, oh, there's these tariffs that are being developed. There are all these different programs that are in the, in the mix, uh, but they're not gonna be around for a few years. And they said, well, we've had tribal members die during these blackouts, like legit. They, they just said it straight up and they said, we can't wait. We said, all right. Um, so we went forward with something that we call the networked microgrid. And it's network from a controls perspective. The actual electrons are staying behind the meter. The reason why that's important is because, uh, you know, the power that uh, goes back to what I was talking about earlier, as far as not paralleling with a de-energized grid. The battery systems, the generator systems, they are grid forming on their own but the energy itself is, is contained behind the meter. Now, what's interesting is, is this provides a, a couple of different options and a couple of different um, advantages. This is the first, you do have these little pockets of power, which isn't ideal, but it does give folks, if you have an elderly person on a breathing machine, if you have somebody who does dialysis, when you have a notification of a PSPS event, instead of having to rely on a Honda generator, which may or may not have gas in it, which may or may not work when you want it to work, you can then go to something like the police station, or you could go to the public utilities uh, building, you could go to the community center, you can have the power that you need to write out the PSPS event. Um, the other bits that you see on here is that, uh, you know, it, it then becomes a question of what do you do when you're not operating in an islanding mode? And uh, from there, you know, we look at different ways that we can participate in the ISO if there are uh, as the regulatory tariffs and the FERC orders start to come down to um, make that more of an attractive offer. Once you have all of these different DERs networked, even though they're only networked on the control side, you have a heck of a lot more options because geographically, you now have power in different pockets spread out throughout this, in this case, a very small uh, geographic region. Uh, but you can then collectively bargain across all of those different assets uh, you know, to play in markets as they start to become available. The other thing that's interesting is, is that uh, we expect that in the next few years, right now the PSPS event notification is uh, literally a text message or an email. Um, I've gotten one, I've, I'm in SCE territory, so um, I've gotten several last year, this year. Um, and you basically just get it with as much notice as they can provide. It, you know, ideally it would be 24 or 12 hours or at least 48 to 24 hours, but sometimes it just goes faster than that. And uh, what we expect is, is that that's gonna become an automated system. And when you have this networked approach, you can then uh, take that and put the batteries and put the different DERs in specific charging modes to prepare, to make sure that your batteries are charged, that your generators are ready, that everything is ready to go uh, for when this event comes. And we wanna automate that in the future. As it stands, uh, the idea will be to take in the signal from wherever and just have something at the user interface where the user can go in and manually set that. Not optimal, that's what we have to work with. Um, so uh, what was the other thing I was gonna talk about? Uh, self uh, SGIP, different reporting programs, uh, you know, those are becoming more and more important as you need to uh, you know, provide incentive programs, uh, you know, meter data information as well as take in greenhouse gas signals um, in order to, sorry, I said a 
set a timer there, um, in order to, um, you know, participate in this program to make sure that you're reporting properly. And the idea is to make it uh, both resilient. You, it's 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 an attempt to marry resiliency along with uh, maximizing the asset's value over the course of the asset life. And so that that way you have folks who want to invest in it um, as these tariffs start to become better, as these opportunities become more financially viable, and also provide a, a very high level of uh, service to these uh, communities that you know otherwise would be just sort of on their own. So uh, it's the nickel tour of, of the project and of the company and everything. If you want to talk more, by all means, uh, give me a call and uh, we'll be be happy to talk or you know, ask during the Q and A. We'll be happy to talk to you about it.